Okay, for a little while this morning, we're going to look back at the passage uh, that Anne read for us uh, from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. So, uh, this is a letter to a young church leader in Ephesus called Timothy, and it's by, uh, from the Apostle Paul. And uh, that's the context of, of how that letter uh, became part of inspired Scripture. It was given by God, not just to that church, but to all churches, to us uh, as well today, as it's the living Word of the living God. And last week, I think Corey was looking at um, truth uh, uh, and doctrine and truth and how truth was linked very powerfully uh, to love. So he he was saying that truth is defined in the first section, really, that truth, God's truth is defined by love. And it's love that's defined by God because God is love. So God is the author of love. God is uh, love and that was a really important, that's a really important thing as a foundation for us this morning uh, as we are thinking about uh, this next uh, passage here. Because if your understanding of what truth is, is purely factual, if it's kind of simply objective reality, and if it doesn't impact on your heart and doesn't change your heart, then can I say it's, it's hopeless truth. It's not God's truth, and God's truth is uh, truth revealed. If your determination of what truth is, and if mine uh, is such that it allows us to remain unchanged at the core of our being, in our heart, in our very, what makes me me, what makes you you, if truth doesn't change us, if it, allows us, if it allows us to remain self-righteous or constantly complaining about life or suffering or other people complaining about other people, if it justifies a deep hatred towards people who are not like me, those who are different from me, those who disagree with me, those who don't look like me, or those who I might regard as my enemies, then it's scandalous truth. It's not genuine truth. It's false. It's destructive. It's a lie. It is not God's truth. If you as a Christian, or if I as a Christian, have been a Christian or a believer for 20 years and we, or more, uh, and we kind of, uh, uh, we're we're proud in that, that we say we haven't changed over these 20 years. If, if our knowledge of Jesus Christ hasn't changed us over 20 years, or over 10 years, or over five years, or over five months, then um, there's something that we're not grasping about the reality of Christ's truth. If Christ for you is distant and makes no impact on your life or, or uh, your character, then there's a door closed that should be opened. And it's important to think again, to think again what truth is and who truth is and what difference Jesus makes in your life. Because as we saw last week, above everything, God's truth is incarnate. God's truth is revealed most powerfully and most strongly in a person, in the person of Jesus Christ. He makes that remarkable claim in John 14. An unbelievable claim. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. That's a statement that changes everything. It's an outstanding and remarkable statement that eyeballs us and makes us think about what truth is. That's his claim. That is what Jesus says. And uh, the outworking of Jesus as truth, I think we find in verse 15, uh, which we read, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am the worst. That is the outworking of truth. That that is why Jesus Christ came. And it's a trustworthy saying. Uh, There are five trustworthy sayings in the uh, epistles here, uh, in the pastoral epistles that 
uh, Paul uses. You can look them up differently. This is, it says, this is a trustworthy saying, probably a, a doctrine that had become known in the church. And this is what he says here, that if Jesus is truth, and if, if truth is love, uh, the love looks like Jesus coming in to the world to save sinners. And that's the goal of his truth. And so we see an outworking of love in that. Uh, you know, Jesus' own description of love. What is love? Well, it starts with loving God, doesn't it? And that means a change of heart. Matthew 22, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then it involves loving your fellow believers, your neighbor as yourself. Change of heart. And also Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, it says it means loving your enemies. Change of heart. It's a, it's a, it's a defined love. It's a love that he expresses and shows us and is a love that we need to receive from him because it doesn't come naturally to us. And we see that uh, in no one more clearly than Paul himself, uh, who goes on to explain the truth explosion in his life, how his life was changed so dramatically when he met with, what did he meet with? Did he meet with a philosophy? Did he meet with uh, a, a passage of Scripture? No, he met with Jesus Christ, the risen Savior. He met with truth incarnate on the road, that famous road to Damascus experience. And he is a great example of the revolution that truth uh, brings into our lives and into our hearts. He's an intense example of the power of God's love and the power of grasping what what truth does for us and what truth changes in us. He's a kind of organic template of the gospel, of what it means to be a Christian. I want to look at what he says just for a few minutes this morning. And he argues that there's, there was no one worse than him, that he was the worst person you could ever imagine in this world. Verse 15, he says, uh, you know, uh, of whom uh, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ overwhelmed uh, for me. Uh, in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserves full exception that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. Though formerly, going back to, I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an ins insolent opponent. The worst of sinners, Paul recognizes himself before God. We, you probably don't get more evil than Paul, or as he was called, Saul, uh, before he met with Jesus. Um, he himself was blinded, but he was bl blinded by the truth, at, at least as he saw it. He thought he was doing God's will. He thought he was uh, being obedient to God because he wasn't listening, and he was blinded to the gospel and to the love of God. He was immaculately self-righteous. He would have been first in church every single week. He'd been right in the front row and he would have a Bible open, and he would be lapping up the truth. He kept all the religious rules that needed to be kept. He sought to be good before God, certainly outwardly anyway, but, but what becomes clear is that inside he was very bitter. He was a fanatical zealot out to destroy Christianity, so maybe he was the worst sinner who ever lived, because if he had succeeded, none of us would have been sitting here today. He was out to crush that sect as he saw it. He was out to destroy and to deny the reality and the importance of Jesus Christ. He was a bigoted persecutor, a murderer. He had an angry, hateful heart, and he was bent on annihilation, genocide of a religious minority. He raged, and he hounded the church. He wanted to strangle this uh, and suffocate this fledgling family of God who are bringing the good news to the lost, who are sharing God's love and God's truth. Maybe there was no one ever quite so blind as Paul. Was he the worst sinner of all time? Who knows? But certainly, subjectively, he felt that. He felt that there couldn't be anyone worse, even if maybe objectively, well, that's up to God uh, to reveal. But God's light blinded him on that road to Damascus, physically, if not spiritually, because for the first time he could see. 
He could see the truth of what he was doing. He recognized there must have been something remarkable even in the voice of Jesus, even in his meeting with Jesus, that, that radiated not judgment but love and forgiveness. It, it must have been utterly powerful for him because we don't, we don't have a great deal of information. But to see that he was not going to be damned by his meeting with Jesus, but he was going to be redeemed and saved and forgiven. And what he did see was the motives of his own heart so that he can't imagine that there would have been anyone worse than him. So we see that he, he thinks in his life there's no one worse as he comes face to face with the truth. He meets the truth in Jesus. And the remarkable thing is that Christ came to him. Uh, the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with a faith and love in Jesus Christ. And Christ came into his life and into his uh, experience. Christ met with him so that Christ exposed him that he was persecuting Christ, not Christians. He was crushing truth, not defending it. He was living his own version of that truth because he was number one. And in effect, he was doing the devil's work for him. Hate was blinding him. There was no love in his heart for God. And he heard Christ question him. That divine voice is really important. Saul, Saul. Uh, maybe we should have read that testimony uh, back in Acts. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, that's re it's really important, that testimony, because it's recorded in Acts uh, as an event, but twice later on in Acts, it's also repeated by Paul himself. It was a hugely significant reality for him, his meeting with Jesus Christ, uh, because he repeats it in front of various uh, authorities when he's being uh, uh, on, on trial. He tells them about Jesus Christ, that he met with light and love and truth, that he was found out, he was exposed, the light of Christ touched his heart, but he was forgiven. It was truth like no other. And he put his faith and his trust in Jesus. It all clicked for him. Christ became his savior, his defender, not his detractor. And there was an unbelievable change in his life, a tremendous change from that moment on. Truth changed him. He became thankful, we're told in verse 3, uh, in verse, sorry, 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus, or, uh, our Lord. And he has this great sense of thankful. He was a strong guy. He was a, he was a tough guy. He was a leader, uh, leading men to persecute and, and murder others. But he thanked God for God's strength to him because he realized that though he was tough and macho, uh, he was weak and empty spiritually. And he was humbled by this living God as he received mercy. You, you know, you've got to be humble to receive mercy. We all have to be humble to receive. And he had been a proud man. He confesses his ignorance that he did what he did in ignorance and unbelief. Though he, at that time, thought he was really intelligent and well-read and understanding of the truth. And so grace overflows to him because he senses that he's undeserving, as he says, a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent man. And that's replaced by faith and love and by joy in the living God. And he moves from being stubbornly opposed to being a worshiper in the living God. And he sees Christ's victory. Christ displays his perfect patience and the example of those who are to believe in him for eternal life in verse 16. God takes this worst of all sinners. The truth transforms him and gives him the greatest task. Can you imagine? The one who went to destroy the church becomes the apostle to the Gentiles to grow the church, to change the world. And he recognizes that God is incredibly patient in doing that. God displayed his patience. Now, there's, there's difficulty there, isn't there? Because there were martyrs. There were people that were, were stoned and killed before 
Saul met with Jesus. Suffering was there. Injustice was there. Sadness was there. And in God's timing, it was allowed to happen. Now, there's great mystery in all of these things, and I don't pretend to have any answers. But he does say that it allowed Christ to display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe. That the reason Christ doesn't return today in the midst of all the confusion and darkness we face is because he wants more people to come to know and love him and be redeemed by his grace. Christ's victory and Christ's glory. He speaks there about the Christ that he was destroying in the most remarkable terms, doesn't he? Uh, When he speaks of them, uh, and he speaks of Christ as the king. The king, what does he say? The king of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. To God be glory and uh, honor forever and ever. And it reminds us of what he says in, first, uh, in Colossians 1, where he says that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the one through whom cr- the world was created and the one who came to redeem the world. He's incomparable. So for, for Paul, Jesus isn't a martyred religious leader, and he mustn't be for you and I as believers. He's not some uh, great character from the past that we can have moral lessons from and we can learn to be good and nice and holy. This is the living God, the eternal, immortal, invisible God made flesh who reveals His truth and who's nailed to a cross willingly and voluntarily. Death doesn't take Him. He gives Himself to death because He has paid the price for our sins and is raised on the third day to life so that we can live and we can know that victory ourselves. It's remarkable that the truth is, in essence, hugely personal. It is God. And as we meet with God, our lives will be changed. As we meet with God in Christ, as we give ourselves to Him, our lives will be changed. So, there's this passage where Paul is kind of unpacking what it is to believe, and what it means to believe in Jesus, and the difference truth makes. But what on earth does it mean for us? What does it mean in our lives to take this message and apply it into our own circumstances? One or two things, just uh, as we draw towards a conclusion. God's truth, the truth of God in His Word will always convict us in our hearts. It will convict us uh, always He talks about in verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience, because God's truth will deal with us at that level, a conscience level, not conscious, but a conscience level. And His truth will expose to us that we are sinners, and that's that's humbling for us uh, when we meet with Jesus Christ, uh, God through Jesus Christ. And our testimony will, at different times, surely, will sometimes think, the same as Paul. Oh man, I'm the worst of sinners. There's no one quite like me. I'm glad people can't see my life on the screen. I'm glad they can't see my heart. I'm glad they can't see my motives. I'm glad they can't see how I trip up and fall and fail and all the wrong motives that are in my soul. We may see ourselves sometimes like Paul as the worst of sinners, because, but that's not a bad thing because the gospel is about getting into our heart It's letting His light shine in there, and God's presence will slam our conscience. It will slam our conscience because of who He is and because of His holiness. And and it it will place our heart in tatters before Him because His truth is truth, and it's, it's not cheap. And God will not allow us to just park the bus at the foot of the cross and leave it there. And he'll not let, his truth will not let us just make our own definitions. Well, I can cut that out and we can leave this because he is truth and he's truth incarnate. He doesn't allow us to wallow in our pride or our divisive spirit or our angry heart or our careless uh, lack of consideration for him or for other people. He doesn't allow us to remain self-righteous or disdainful of our friends or even our enemies. 
But listen, thank God for that. Thank God that He loves us enough to give us a conscience that exposes our heart. It doesn't necessarily expose it to everyone. Thank God for that. But as we deal with Him eyeball to eyeball, he will ex- His love and His grace will expose where we need to see the change that only His power and glory and grace can change us and forgive us and renew us. So maybe you're not a Christian here this morning, but you're searching for the truth. You're looking for truth. Can I encourage you not simply to uh, focus on uh, something philosophical or merely objective, existential, and not just be content with something that you think is solid but safe, you know, that leaves you untroubled, that leaves you without uh, a pricked conscience, without being exposed, because God's truth strips us naked. That's His truth. That's what it will do. Why? Because grace is amazing. Because grace is absolutely amazing. In verse 14, he says, it was the grace of our Lord that overflowed for me when with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Grace is amazing. Grace transformed immediately Paul as he accepted and saw that despite who he was, Christ Jesus was the one who had paid the price for all of that and who had, in his justice, provided a way forward that met also his great love. Because if we never see that, if we never see in our hearts who he is and his holiness, we're never really going to, we're never going to enjoy and receive nor find grace amazing. It'll be plain, dull, ordinary grace, grace that we can toss aside, grace that's not that important, grace that may sound nice and may appeal at some levels. But our journey to wholeness requires that deep-seated relationship with Jesus where He pours out His forgiveness as He exposes our need and our hearts. And He does so because He's never miserly. It's not just pipettfuls of grace that He tips onto us. He lavishly overflows His grace into our hearts and into our lives. And it therefore changes our understanding of His holiness and also of His character and our priorities towards Him. He welcomes us into His divine family, into His company. He shows us day, step by step, day by day, what we were, who we were created to be, the purpose, the love, the hope, the trust, the goodness. He deals with our inner Scrooge. He helps us to see that giving is better than getting. And He helps us through the impossibilities of suffering, which we don't have answers to, but which by faith and trust, we believe He will take us through because He knows. And we have an incomparable future in Him. And He comes for you. And in Christ, if you're a Christian for a long time or maybe not a long time, you can be assured that He has come for you. Just as he came for Paul, he's come for you to reveal and to show his grace. So God's truth convicts us, but his grace is amazing, and we are called to hold on to that truth. In verse 18, 19, particularly, he speaks to Timothy, and he says, holding faith and a good conscience, um, remember the truth in this warfare that you're in, and he exposes the shipwreck of others uh, in the leadership or who want to be leaders, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who have rejected and turned away from that truth. And there's a really, I think there's a really important picture there uh, for us all is that that picture of shipwreck. You know, um, if if you reject Christ as your Savior, I know there's short-term, we think there's short-term gain of doing that sometimes because it's, it's tough, you know, self-denial and following Jesus. Um, and, you know, we, we remain Lord over our own lives and that can give us a sense of significance and importance. But if we drift from the gospel of Jesus uh, or reject Him, or as Christians, if we're tempted to drift from 
the obedience of love and following Jesus, then basically Paul's saying it's a car crash in modern parlance. Shipwreck. Your life is, will be a shipwreck because of that spiritually. And that was what was going to happen to Hymenaeus and Alexander. They rejected the core truths. His second epistle speaks about Hymenaeus who rejected the resurrection, or at least um, he thought that the resurrection had already taken place and there was, it was, there was spiritual truths and myths that uh, people had to know about. And uh, he seemed, these, both of them seemed to be keeping Jesus out of their hearts. They seem to have ignored the need for a good conscience. A good conscience didn't matter. Well, it doesn't really matter. You can believe what you believe. And we kept him out of our hearts and of our conscience. And they were handed over, as it were, to a place of without protection, uh, a place where Jesus Christ's love wasn't in order to expose that and to bring them back. We would call that excommunication probably today in the hope that they would see that turning away from Christ is to shipwreck your faith. And Timothy had this you know, significant and important apostolic authority to remind that early church of the danger of just rejecting Jesus or just throwing him out as if it didn't really matter. And so we are called today, and Jesus calls us to hold on just as uh, Paul encouraged Timothy to hold on to a good conscience and to hold on to the faith, to the truth, to the doctrine, to the teaching of Jesus Christ. Now, we, we need to hold on to that in our own conscience because sometimes it's, it's tough, isn't it? It's very difficult to, to see yourself in the mirror, especially in the mirror of Scripture. But we never stop there. Because we look into the, the face of Jesus and see forgiveness and wholeness. And we must see that for ourselves and also for us as a church. We need to fight for the truth. And walking away, maybe today, you think that walking away will be easier and it may seem easier. And in many ways, it is easier, at least in the short term, sometimes. But you're walking away from the person of Jesus, walking away from his beauty, from his forgiveness, from his protection, from his love. You're grieving, quenching, resisting his spirit. And I would encourage you if you're tempted that way today, and who of us haven't been, and who of us aren't at different times in our lives, just go back to Jesus. Go back to that, that place where you first believed Go back to the simplicity of meeting with Jesus. Deal with all the complications and difficulties. Put them aside for a while. I'm not saying, uh, love me, love me, I'm thick. I'm just going back to sort of uh, not thinking. We, we take our deepest thoughts and we bring them to the person of Jesus and we wrestle through him, wrestle with him through these challenges that we face. Because God is love. And that's the doctrine that we need to stick with. That we love him, that we love one another, and that we love our enemies. There's not another truth in the world that says that. Because there is no other truth than God, this God who is uh, the king of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory. That is the truth that we have that's the truth that will change our lives. Paul is a fantastic example that no one is too bad to come to Jesus Christ for rescue and redemption and eternal life. Isn't it sad there's lots of maybe our friends and colleagues and people around us who say, oh, if I went to church, you know, the, the ceiling would come down. I'm just a bad guy. And yeah, you know, Jesus will not accept me because if we somehow have got everything turned upside down. That's exactly what we are all like, every single one of us. And there wouldn't be a church roof in the world if that were any different. So Paul's a fantastic example and reminder to us uh, of what truth does for us in our hearts. And I guess Hymenaeus and Alexander are also a great example that you can never think you're good enough not to need Jesus and can drift from Jesus without a cost 
and without experiencing unimaginable loss. So Jesus is presented in His Word, and it's Jesus we focus on in your struggles, in your battles, in the difficulties, in the questions, in the fears, in the things we don't understand. We come to Jesus, and we meet with Jesus. We have our Damascus Road experience every day as we come to His feet in faith and trust. Let's pray. Father God, we ask and pray you would help us to see more clearly who you are, that we would focus more clearly on who you are, and that the length of time between your life on earth, uh, your death and resurrection, would not change anything, because you yourself are out with uh, the scheme of time, and you are ever-present, and uh, we uh, come before you today, and we seek forgiveness, uh, we seek honesty, integrity, we ask that we would live in the light of what Jesus has done and allow you to wrestle with our hearts. We know there's so many things that we keep. We have no go areas. We have no entry signs. Lord, help us to deal with them. Uh, however difficult, however challenging to us, to, to me, uh, to a, a, every individual here, may we be those people who recognize that God knows our hearts and he it's not that we confess because we tell him what he doesn't know, but we confess because he wants us to recognize a self-honesty and a need for him. And may we know amazing grace. May it be reflected in the way we act as a church, the way we speak to each other, the way we share coffee and tea together, the way we speak to visitors, the way that we respond when things go wrong and when our fellow Christians let us down. May we love our neighbors. And may we love our enemies in a world which hates its enemies uh, and in a world which uh, makes that friendship circle smaller and smaller and smaller. Lord, help us to love those who don't look like us, think like us, act like us, believe like us, and to do it with self-sacrificial commitment. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.